Okay, um, this is just a quick demonstration to show you how you can use um, AWS to run an R Studio account. Um, it's very easy to do, especially because we're going to build on work of other people who have uh, pre-created um, hardened images that we can use in order to do that. Um, by now, you should have access to your AWS Educate account, although this thing we're doing works um, regardless of whether you're on um, the Educate account or the regular one. And um, again, I think I mentioned in the other video that AWS has a ton of relatively cheap or even free resources, certainly as you're learning new software, but even if you keep your usage down, you can actually um, get pretty cheap um, access to AWS. Um, I'm doing the AWS demonstration in depth, partially because this AWS Educate account did give you the $50 free. Um, because you use your uh, truman.edu account, um, you can do it again with your work account or whatever. And the same is true for Google Cloud or, or Microsoft Azure or whatever you do. So anyway, go ahead and sign into your Educate account and this console will open up. Um, the um, service we're gonna use is called EC2. EC2 is kind of the generic um, elastic cloud computing, they call it. It's elastic because again, you only pay for what you use um, rather than getting a dedicated server. Um, EMR is the one we'll use for Spark and Sparkly R. That is Elastic MapReduce. And so again, it was set up to run uh, Hadoop, although now it also runs um, Spark as well. So um, we click on EC2. It takes you to a list of all the services you've already uh, run. I um, have several that I've already made and some that I've deleted, including one that I used to test this out just a few minutes ago. So those will probably all still be there. So um, we click on Instances. And, uh, oh, my old ones aren't there. So um, we just go ahead and click launch instances. And that's good to go. Um, the default is the base Linux server. You can see Mac is also there. You can see there's Windows, all kinds of other things um, that are good, Debian and whatever you wanna use. Um, we're actually gonna use um, the pre-created one by uh, Lewis Alstead. And so Lewis is his name. And um, I'm just gonna search for that. And you can see that none are in the Quick Start catalog, but in the community AMIs, there's one there. And so again, uh, this one is Lewis Allslet is the guy's name. And we just go ahead and select it. Um, again, it's nice because it already has R and R Studio configured. Um, he updates it every so often. So it has relatively new versions of things. Um, it has the packages um, already installed. So that's why I think that's good. Um, we're gonna use this micro uh, free tier one um, again, this account has $50, so you could use one of the faster ones. Um, as you can see, they go from nano, micro, small, medium, large, and then the T numbers um, get faster as you get to fancier machines. You can see some of these down here we're not actually eligible to use with our free account. Um, but again, this free one will work just fine for us. I found the T2 micro to be just about the same as my laptop. Um, so, you know, in the sense that it's free, um, if say you didn't have a laptop, you were running from your Chromebook or you were um, traveling and you were using, I don't know, the hotel computer or something, um, this could be a way to get RStudio to run um, in a cool way. I've seen even people use it from their tablet. Maybe if you had a tablet with a keyboard, you could um, work right from there. That would still kind of freak me out a little bit. All right, we're gonna go through some of these options here. Um, again, the instance details, we're not gonna worry about. Um, the add storage, if you need more storage, you can add that on, of course, that costs extra. Um, tags are a way you can look across your processes. If you had a ton of processes, that would be really helpful. I've never had more than a couple at a time, so I'm not too worried about that. Then um, where we are gonna have to do things here is configure our security group. And this is really important. So you wanna add um, HTTP as one of the options that you do here. Over here, if you keep these as zero, that's gonna let you log in from anywhere. And while that sounds good, um, in practice, you might wanna just come from your own IP so that you can um, <clears throat> get it to work. Um, some people I know, they keep the SSH um, as the um, anywhere they can get on it. Um, that way, if they do have a problem with their own account, um, they can use uh, TTY, um, PuTTY or whatever to get into that. That's not a thing I do very much, and I'm just going to make them my IP so I don't get that warning. Then we click Review um, Launch. Um, it gives you all your choices that you've made. Uh, when you click Actual Launch, um, it's gonna ask you to set up um, a public key for the secure SSH connection. 
Um, I really do think it's good for you to set up one. I already have one going here. It's called Gumby. Um, that is that long string of characters that they use for um, authentication. Um, in combination with a password, it uh, makes your thing secure. Because this account does have a common password set up until you log in, um, using that is actually good. All right, so um, it's going to take a couple minutes to set up, so I'm going to let it um, do that. While it's doing that, I'm going to mention a couple other features of AWS Educate. The workbench keeps track of how much you've used. Um, again, um, you can see I've been logged in for two minutes and 41 seconds. That's of processor time, not of me being logged in. I've been logged in for hours. Um, trying to get everything to work. And you can see that I still have my full $50 yet left because that two hours together hasn't even used um, a noticeable dollar of everything. That console that we had before, it does list all of the various services that are in there. Um, some of the common ones are up here. It also has these really nice tutorials. And so I think um, while you're in the free account, um, you could go in and learn how to use those. Um, it has videos and um, even some lab assignments that are kind of automatically graded as you do that. All right, I'm going to go back to my uh, list of instances um, and see how it's doing. All right. So here we are. And it looks like it is pretty well um, ready to go. So when you do that, um, this is going to be your web address. This is your initial password. This is the Amazon assigned uh, code for your process. Um, so you might want to keep that for there. So if you click connect, um, you can see there are several different ways you can connect. Um, as you do that, um, we're going to open that up. And there you go. And here you get your RStudio sign-in. Um, your username is going to be RStudio because, that, again, that's how Lewis Aslet assigned it. And your instance ID is going to be your password. Um, if you click Stay Signed In, next time you come on to your web page, it should log you in automatically with that. Um, OK. And then here you are inside RStudio. And again, it takes a minute to start up. And Um, after this first time, it doesn't take even this short little bit of delay here to get going. But um, again, it's building a whole computer for you from scratch. So I suppose that's actually pretty quick if you think of how that goes. All right. So um, here's the note from Lewis Auslet, um, including what version it runs. This is running inside of Ubuntu, but you can see how he has it set up. We didn't actually see um, the regular R um, Linux interface at all. Um, it just went straight into RStudio. And that's why I do like this as a thing. Um, I do want to mention he has this uh, package that he highlights called RStudio AMI. And it has some commands um, that are specific um, for uh, RStudio server um, that lets you do um, some cool things. Um, this includes a thing that will let you change your password, which is good since you already um, did that. But it's kind of cool because that RStudio AMI will let you control your server functions from RStudio. Um, another command that's in there that I think is pretty snazzy is link Dropbox. Link Dropbox does what it sounds like. It links to your Dropbox account. So if you remember uploading uh, files can be a bit of a pain. I think you already experienced that in the Spark server. So using link Dropbox here um, will let you just put files into your Dropbox account. For super big files, that might not work, but um, it is a pretty quick um, and dirty way to do that. Last thing before I end this video um, is to just mention that when you set up Spark, there are several ways you can do it. One is you can set up your Spark cluster as a separate thing, um, and then you can load RStudio onto that and have an interface like this. Um, that is actually, in some ways, the fastest one because everything is happening at the AWS site. Um, it often costs a little bit more because now your RStudio work is now inside of um, your expensive server. You can also set up R as an edge node. And so you could keep this very account running um, as sort of your connection to the Spark server that we could set up separately. And then you can just uh, connect between them just like you did on that Spark assignment that you had um, in the earlier module. 
A third way to do it is you can run RStudio on your own computer and just set up the Spark cluster on AWS as a remote server. Um, that works well, although again, the data transfer sometimes adds a little bit of time to that. Of course, it also assumes that your local machine is good enough to do that. So with that, um, that is sort of a quick and dirty introduction to running RStudio on um, the uh, AWS uh, system. And um, there you go. So 